right, all right. Wow, those guys, those little kids, they are just at the very beginning of the great adventure of life, right? Just starting it out. I believe that God has designed life to be a great adventure with him. Not just something that we wander through, not just something we figure out on our own. I don't know what God is doing in the rest of the universe. All right, it's a big universe, right? We are just a, a little, little, little part of it, but he has paid attention to our little corner of the universe. He's spoken to us in his word, and he's told us what he's doing, and he's invited us in with him to walk with him uh, as, he, as he works on this planet, and that's just an amazing thing to me. Um, here's the thing about any true adventure, though. The kind that are worth doing is that they are bigger than you. They're about more than you. They have a, a purpose greater than you. Th those are the adventures that are worth living. And a couple weeks ago, Pastor Greg laid out the whole big picture of God's adventure. Uh, the, the, that big picture where he told us of God's creation, our rebellion as a human race, the promise of redemption and reconciliation. And, and he told us and he laid out for us and he invited us to think of ourselves as part of that story because that's, well, honestly, reality. That, that's, that's thinking in terms of reality here. And, and, and Christmas is that celebration of this moment of clarity when, when this catalytic moment happened, when God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, became a man. And, and the verse that's just been rattling around in my head as I've been thinking about the Christmas series is, is this one here right now. Would you read this with me? But when the time, set, time had come, I can't read it right. Let's start over again. I'm reading it in another translation. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. And that just blows my mind that, that, that God, in this particular moment of history that we are celebrating, has sent his son, God the Son, to be born of a woman, to be born under the law, to be born under all the constraints, all the obligations, all the, all the, the duties, everything that, that, that we experience. He is born under that to redeem those of us who are falling short of the glory of God. Why? Jesus did that so that you and I could receive the, 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 the rights of sonship are his rights. So that we could receive everything. In fact, the Bible says that we are co-heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ in Christ. That's why he did what he did. And that's the, that's the kind of the meta-narrative of God's story for us. This is why Jesus came. And when he did this, like he normally does, like in anything, the way he seems to work on this planet is he didn't act unilaterally. He just didn't come down, and he doesn't just do it all by himself because that's not the way he created this world to work. He always does his work through and with people. He invited ordinary people like you and me to join him, and he is still doing that today. And that is the purpose of this series. We want to take a look at this, this catalytic moment, this intense moment, because sometimes when we're in this intense moment, the things that are really important get blown up big enough that we can see them, when in the normal duties of life and everything we're doing, we can kind of pass right over them and not see and not understand what God is doing. And so we're going to let this moment give us an insight that we might better join God in the adventure that he has invited us into. Last week, we learned from Mary, the mother of Jesus, how to say, I'm all in, and to do it decisively. This week, we're turning to Joseph. Now, when I, when I think about Joseph, um, you, know, you think about you know, God having a call on my life. And, and sometimes when we think about that call, it's like, okay, just be honest. Okay, maybe this is just me. Okay, maybe this isn't you. You're more holy than I am, all right? But for me, I think in terms of, okay, great, how is God going to make me a hero? How is God going to... Uh. And then I look at the story of Joseph. 
can we be honest, just here between us, that Joseph's call was to be the third wheel? Am I right? Joseph call. Is, he is, you know, God, God loves him, has a wonderful plan for life. God, I want you to be the third wheel in the Christmas story. This is what I have for you. There's a good lesson in that for you and me. A really good lesson. We're going to talk about that today. But he's not the main character. It's not all about him. In fact, it's about something bigger than him. But aren't we glad Joseph did what God called him to do? You know? So, so let's think about this. Because um, to do, here's the deal. To do what God was calling him to do would stretch him in ways that he never anticipated. Because you see, when you're involved in doing something that's bigger than you, you're going to be stretched. It's just the way it works. And, and, and you'll need to learn to rely on God like Joseph did. Now, I, I want to tell you, as I'm, as I'm going through this text, it's not like there's some, some you know, big verse in this passage that says Joseph relied on God and here's what he did. And, you know, as I read it, I pull that out of the text just because as I'm looking at how things worked out, I mean, it's, it's not that it said he relied on God. It's just that he did rely on God. And we just, we see him just do that here as he's being stretched. And, and here's my definition of reliance. First, you expect that God will lead, he will guide, and he will provide. You, you have a basic expectation that God will do those three things. He will lead, he will guide, and he will provide. And the second aspect of, of reliance is really, really important, and that you decisively act in obedience as he does. That's what reliance looks like. That's what it means to have a life that says, I am living my life in reliance on God. I believe that he will lead. I believe that he will guide. I believe that he will provide. And when he does, I am committed to acting decisively in obedience to what he's called me to. Because you see, the key to success in God's adventure is learning total reliance at the moment we're being stretched. That's the only moment that really counts. Total reliance when you're not being stretched really doesn't mean anything, does it? But it's that moment when you are feeling the stretch, when you are feeling the pull. And, uh, and we want to take a look in these next few minutes. We want to look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Because you see, in any adventure, preparation is critical, right? You got to think about what's going to happen. You got to be ready. You want to anticipate some of the things that you are going to be facing. And, and today, as we're going to look at the story of, of Joseph, we want to look at some of the things that I think we can all anticipate that we are going to face as we seek to walk with God and to anticipate the ways that we are going to be stretched. Because Joseph's story, I think, highlights four of many ways that we can be stretched and expect it to be stretched as we move on this adventure. So, so let's, let's look at stretch number one. If we're really going to follow Christ, we are going to follow, and in this big adventure, we are going to find ourselves facing moral dilemmas, moral choices that we have to make. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, we read, we read the first moral dilemma that, that he is facing. It says, now, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and, and, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. When, when Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, he has a moral decision to make. He has a moral dilemma. Now, maybe you say, well, it's not a moral dilemma at all. You know, she obviously, she cheated on him. He should just, you know, forget it. It's all done. It's, you know, it's, it's not a problem. It's not a hard decision at all. And yet, for, for Joseph, it was. 
Because he understood that he was making a moral decision here. And the important statement here is where it says this, that Joseph, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, is what it says in the NIV. It says righteous in some of your other translations. If you go to the really old translations, it says just. So we see that Joseph was just, he's righteous, he's faithful to law. And that is really important. I really like the way the NIV interprets that. Because in our secular society, when you just say, well, he was a righteous man, the way we tend to think about it is we tend to say, well, he was a righteous man. He had a moral compass, right? He, it was his moral compass. But we got to understand, that's thinking like secular 20th century people. When this was written, righteousness was not determined by some internal moral compass that we all think that we have. That's the dogma of secularism. Righteousness was determined by our alignment, our faithfulness to the law of God. That was the, that's the standard. And so when it says that Joseph is a righteous man, that's really what it's saying is that, that he was looking at the law of God, not some internal moral compass. He was looking at the law of God and he was saying to himself as he was living his life, how do I live in line with this law of God, which I know is right, which I know is good, which I know is what God wants for me and for this world. And that's the way that he was doing it. And I want to tell you, when you live that that way, you will find yourself in, in moral dilemmas. You will find yourself having to make choices that are difficult. And I think for, for Joseph, as a man who sought the, to, the word of God and, and as, the, as the standard of his life, I think he knew Micah 6, 8. Because when I read this passage and I think about Joseph's response and I meditate on it, this is the verse that comes to my mind, Micah 6, 8. And it says, would you just read this with me? He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Boy, that verse right there is a moral dilemma, isn't it? To act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with God? You know, that's, what I, that's what I see Joseph trying to wrestle with. Okay, I know this is what God wants for me in this situation. How do I do this? How do I act justly? How do I love mercy in this situation with, with Mary? How do I walk humbly with, it, with my God? And he came to the solution that he would, he would have to divorce her because obviously he couldn't trust her, but he would do it quietly. He would do it with mercy. And, uh, and, and that's what he came to. You see, often justice and mercy seem to be at intractable odds. But because he was a man who sought to live righteously, there wasn't a simple answer. He, he understands that to honor God in the situation and to obey him and to follow him is a challenge. He understands that it's not, it's not necessarily, it's not really about what Mary did to him. God isn't going to hold him accountable for what Mary did to him. It's about what he does to Mary. And that's what mattered. And he got that. He understood that. And I believe his biggest motivation was how do I do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with my God as I'm making a moral decision. And I think the writer wants us to be aware that Joseph is seeking God and God speaks and I just believe that this to be so true, that when we are in the midst of these moral dilemmas, when we really seek God, he will speak. He will reveal in many different ways. Now, Joseph got a dream and an angel. In verse 20, it says, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And, and, and Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. God gave him the clarifying revelation that he needed for something that he couldn't discover any other way. And I believe God will do that for you too as we seek to follow him and this is really it's really critical as we follow God to realize that in, into this we are going to have to make moral decisions that we have a lot of them that we make and now I'm, I'm guessing not many of you are being asked to marry a, a virgin who is conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit is there anybody out there today and so maybe you're thinking that this doesn't 
This doesn't apply to you because, you know, well, when am I going to be in a situation like that, right? I want to tell you that, again, remember this gets blown up in these big things so that we can understand it better in the little things. Let me get right down into some really little things that might be a little personal right now. Um, There's all sorts of ways. We need to be aware that we are making moral decisions when we discipline our children. Did you know that, that disciplining our kids is a moral decision? It, it, every time that we do. Why? Because what's the purpose of discipline? To teach them? Obedience? How about right and wrong? Right? Obedience, but, but right and wrong. Does that sound like a moral decision? You, you, every time you discipline a child, it is about teaching right and wrong. And, and, so, and, and so when you think about that... It, and some of you parents are going, no wonder it's so hard, right? No wonder it's so difficult. Because it is about something that's really core. And, you know, and we need to be careful sometimes because as parents, I'll just be honest, I can speak from experience. My discipline is sometimes more about my convenience than about their learning right and wrong, right? Do I have any brothers and sisters out there? You know, it, it, and, and, and sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the, the battle isn't for my convenience. This is a moral decision that I'm making. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm walking through this. And, you know, I think, or you get a jab from a coworker to do something else at work. And you get a put down or something from a coworker. Your response to that is a moral decision. We could go on and on. But we face moral decisions every day in which we are going to live out the adventure that God has for us. And, 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 and the second thing we got to say is that, that when we do the right thing, we say we want to do the right thing, we can't just say, well, here's a rule from the Bible and now I know what to do. That's actually very dangerous. We need to seek God like Joseph did seriously because when you seek to follow God, you will have these, and it's, and it's difficult. And, you know, one thing for Terry and me, and we were raising our kids, and now that we're, well, we're, you know, I don't know. You just never stop raising kids. They just get older, that's all. And, but, and grandkids, it's like for us, th- it has to be a thing of constant prayer. We, we never wish we had prayed less. We prayed a lot, but we only wish we had prayed more. And because every time we saw him, he does give revelation. He does show us how to proceed. And sometimes it feels like we're stepping into the dark off of a cliff, but God will speak and he will lead. And I want to tell you that whatever it is, whether it's disciplining kids, dealing with what's going on at at, at work or or anything else, that, that when we don't say just what was the Bible say, but God, how do I apply it? How do I... How do I do justice? How do I love mercy? How do I walk humbly with you into this? In those moments when we are feeling so stretched, when we are feeling so stretched, we rely on God. He will speak. And he will teach. And this matters because God is always doing something bigger. These moral dilemmas, these these choices that we have, that we make, are actually the points of intersection where God is is entering in, where God is, is really moving. These are the powerful points. These are points of change as God is moving us along in the adventure that we have with him. You know, and, and God used Joseph to bring his son and salvation into the world. And, and, and these moments, the message of salvation in our world comes to our kids, it comes to our coworkers, it comes to our neighbors, it comes to strangers. We need to be ready to be stretched with moral dilemmas, moral choices that we need to make. But one stretch leads to another. And the clarity of the moral dilemma then leads to the next one that Joseph has to face. And stretch number two is going public. Oh, I hate this one. Don't you wish we could just stay under the radar and nobody know or notice? I'll do the right thing just under here, right? But, but here's the deal. Verse 24, it sounds so simple. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Now, it's easy to just to go, just go pie there. But stop for a moment. 
Think about this. He has to get on his donkey. Or what? Maybe he just walked. I don't know. Maybe he didn't have a donkey. But there's a donkey in the Christmas story. Anyway, even if it's not in the Bible, there's a donkey. All right? He had to get on his donkey. And he had to ride through Nazareth. Small town. Any small town people here? I want to ask you, small town people, how many people in that small town knew Mary was pregnant? All of them. He had to ride through town. He had to go up, knock on her dad's door. Say, Mr. Mary's mom, Mary's dad. We don't know his name. We made an agreement several months ago or years ago, or maybe it was just my parents had an agreement with your parents that I would marry Mary. Today I'm here to uh, make good on that agreement, and I'm going to fulfill that. And it was right out there for everybody to see. Marriage is a public thing. And there he was, out there for the world. Folks, there are times when following Jesus means that you're just going to have to be out there. And it's going to stretch you. It's going to be difficult. This last Thursday, I had the privilege of speaking at the Chan Hassan uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes group. And I don't know if you know anything about Fellowship of Christian Athletes, but it's a student-led organization. And it was just so cool to be there and to see these, these students, you know, standing up in front of each other and, you know, and, 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 you know, hey, invite your friends to come. And they're standing there and they're saying things like, by the way, you know, if you got a test today or you got a game or you got something you're struggling with, if you write it down and put it in this bucket right here, and, you know, there's about four kids up there in the front we will pray for you. Talk about declaring who you are and what you are and what you are about. And by the way, we got this, this crazy guy from Rogers coming up, and he's going to preach the gospel to you. Uh, you know, they are putting it out there. And it was inspiring to be there. I hope I didn't embarrass the family. I just, oh, man, I'm just so, it, just, it was so cool. Um, but they're just out there because Jesus said put it this way. He said, you are the light of the world. You're a city on a hill that cannot be hid. I love it. Cannot be hid. You can try, but you cannot be hid. Nobody lights a, 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 a candle and sticks it under a bushel. They, they, they light it and they put it on the lampstand for everybody to see. I didn't light you up. I didn't fill you with the light of my life so that I could hide you someplace. I filled you with the light of my life because I want everybody to see it because I want everybody to have what I gave you. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works. They see the life that you live. They see my presence in your life and they give glory to God. I, don't, I love it. And it doesn't say, and they come and repent. That's, that's not your job. You don't need to worry about that. God will take care of that. He just wants them to see your life and to see what he's doing in you. And out of what he's doing to you, he will bring glory to the Father, and God will take care of the rest. God will take care of the rest. Why does it matter? Because God is going public through you. It says in verse 23 that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And right now, God with us is God working through his people in this world as the Spirit works in and through us. And this matters because of verse 21, which says that she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, because the, the salvation of the world is at stake because God sees people who are going to hell because of their sins and he wants to save them and he wants to use them and he, he wants to save them and he wants to use us to do it. He wants to bring this salvation. He wants people to experience the forgiveness of sin, the release from guilt, and the restoration of a relationship with the God that they were created to know and to love and who knows them and loves them more than they'll ever understand. 
Sometimes we just got to go public. God calls us to go public. And it sounds so simple, but let's be honest. Anybody here been stretched by that thought sometimes from time to time, right? It stretches us. We need to be ready to be stretched. But God will provide, and God will do, and God will act as we rely on him. The third stretch is is when you start to put it out there. I don't know about you. I'll just be really brutally honest with you right now. I struggle with self-consciousness every time I get up and stand in front of you. Anybody else here feel self-conscious from time to time? And this is where we got to learn what Joseph kind of had to wrestle with. Stretch number three is so subtle, but it's so important. Hit it, Steve. Say it with me, folks. It's not about me. And we see that in verse 25, which is one of the most amazing verses in this Bible. Uh, Not in the Bible, but in this story, excuse me. It says, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. Again, another verse that's easy just to slide over and to glide over. But Joseph understood that the adventure wasn't ultimately about him. He was not the hero. It was not about Mary. She was not the hero. They gave him the name Jesus. Why? Because the angel said he would save his people from their sins because he is the hero. The only way I would ever stand up in front of a group of people like you and, and, and pretend that I had anything to say is if I could point you to Jesus. He's the hero. Everything we do it's about pointing to him. And Joseph got that. And in this, he, he honors Mary and what God is doing through Mary. And he takes the supporting role. He sets aside his desires as a man. He sets aside his rights as a, as a husband as, as not as important as doing what God has called in him to do. His desires and his rights are not as important as doing what God has called him to do because it's about Jesus. And I want to tell you that this is common among people who do great things and it, it, that, that they set aside desires and rights for something greater. That they might accomplish that. And why does this matter? Well, when I read verse 25, I'm just impressed by the integrity. He isn't fo- he's focused on the right things because he's not focused on himself because it's about Jesus And when we do that, then we act with integrity and effectiveness. I I will be in touch with God and what he is doing for his glory instead of how I can use and how I can arrange this world for my glory. Jesus says, whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. Whoever exalts themselves will be humbled. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness which is really ultimately just saying, just put me first. Just make your life about me. And everything else will be given to you as well. That's it. But you must rely on him. You must rely on him. And this is so important because when God set out and set you and invited you into this adventure, you don't know where it will take you. You don't know the path that God is going to call you on. You don't know the difficulties that you're going to face. You don't know all of these things. And for Joseph, you know, it takes him from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It takes him from obscurity and poverty into a notoriety that he didn't want. Because after Jesus was born, they stayed in Bethlehem um, to make a home. 
And, uh, you know, it says, and, and one day, it says in, in chapter 2, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? We have seen a star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And it says, and when King Herod heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Of course he was troubled, of course, all, because his throne was being challenged. And of course, all Jerusalem was troubled because Herod had a reputation of what he did when and he felt like his throne was trouble or was was being challenged and and the magi come and they find out he's born in Bethlehem and they come and I can't even imagine that day when you know keep in mind it's not just three guys on camels I mean they had to go through um, you know lawless territory with great wealth they probably had an entourage of soldiers they probably had servants to take care of their needs we're probably talking you know about a hundred people or so knocking on the door of whatever little house joseph could afford as a carpenter saying excuse me ma'am we'd like to come worship your son and then it says warned in a dream they go home by another route but Herod, realizing that he has been outwitted, is furious, and he comes down with vengeance upon Bethlehem. And here's the fourth stretch that Joseph faced, and that is the stretch of opposition. And we need to be ready for that. And in verse 13, yet as he relies on God, God God provides, God supplies. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And so he got up. He took the child and his mother during the night, and they left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I will call my son. You know, when we, when we set out on this journey and as we seek to walk into this adventure of God, the truth of the matter is, is not everybody's going to be happy with you. Now, sometimes it's more obvious in, in things happening in other countries. I read recently of a, of a, of a man who had, uh, had turned to Christ out of Islam who, uh, who became a refugee when war came through their country and he went from that country into another Islamic country and how, um, how basically he's being maligned to employers so he can't get a job because obviously he's crazy because he left Islam. Um, and his family has great pressure um, because they're, you know, they're infidels and it's a very hard time for their family because they are following Jesus. But in the book of Acts, as I read, this was basic training for new believers. In fact, the Apostle Paul at one point says, you know, to, to a bunch of new believers, says, by the way, don't you remember when we, we led you to Christ, we also told you about this, that we, we prepared you for this. We prepared you for the struggle. We prepared you for the opposition that you were going to face. We prepared you that it was going to be difficult. Why it matters it's because sometimes to get where God is leading us, we got to go through hard roads, difficult paths. It, it is sometimes very tough. It is sometimes through the valley of the shadow that we have to go to get where God is leading us. But I will point out one thing. Did anybody notice how just before this journey... God paid for it. You know how? Say it with me. With gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And he gave them everything that they needed to make the journey that they were facing. Because when you rely, God supplies. And when you are stretched and you are at the point of really where you are probably being most effective for God. Where, where, where you are doing your part to the greatest effectiveness. And whatever it's seemingly insignificant to you thing that it, it, that it seems. That when you, are, when you are there, God is working. 
And as you call out to him, and as you rely on him, and as you step out into the dark, yes, even when it feels like you're stepping off the edge of the cliff, he will catch you. And he will provide for you. You see, the king, the key to success in God's adventure is learning total reliance when we are stretched. So that, so, so I just ask you, what are you facing today that's stretching you? You know, maybe it's a moral dilemma, maybe moral choices that you're facing. Maybe it's the, 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 the struggle to go public or just that it's not about me. Or maybe it's some really strong opposition. I don't, I don't know what you're facing. But this is reliance that you expect him to lead and to guide and provide. And you're saying, well, where is the angel? Where is the angel? I'll tell you where the angel is. You have something better than the angel. Because you see, if you believe Matthew 121 that says that he will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, and you have believed that he has saved you from your sins, do you believe that today? Then you have been seen. Well, I'll just let the, I'll let the Apostle Paul tell you what it is. He says, you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which is this message right here, that Christ died for your sins, that he was raised from the dead on the third day, and that you have life and salvation when you put your faith in him. Would you do that today if you haven't? But when you do, when you believe the gospel of your salvation, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. What that is basically saying is, you know, you're not in heaven yet. But until you get there, God has given you his Holy Spirit to be within you, to guide you, to lead you, to be God with you through all that you are going through. Isn't that good news today? You are not on your own. Emmanuel is with you in the person of the Holy Spirit if your faith is in Jesus Christ. And he will help you. So if you take the tear off today, we're going to give you a chance to do some reflection here. Um, in what areas of your life are you being challenged to practice total reliance on God? I don't know that you, you know, if you want to put something out, that's, that's, that's good. But right now, we're just going to play a song. And, and I want to give you an opportunity just to reflect and to ask God, you know, where are you feeling the stretch? Maybe it's one of these four things. Maybe it's some other area. I don't know. But you and God know. And we want to give you a, a chance here right now just to take those things and to lay them out before God. And, and the, the, the worship team's just going to sing a song to encourage you in that. That you, would, that you would just rely on him in this thing that has you stretched, whatever it might be. That you would just seek him. And that the Spirit would work in your situation as you're seeking to follow God in his adventure. All right. And now may the God that gives endurance and encouragement give us a spirit of unity among ourselves as we follow Christ Jesus because we do not do this alone. Amen? Amen. And so as we, we would just speak out the truth of Jesus with one heart and with one mouth that we would declare the praise and the glory of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do that together this week. Have a great week.